one of the um, skills is for students to be able to uh, analyze an argument and determine an author's claim and understand the strategies an author uses to make that claim. And once they've um, identified that, to be able to respond to it with appropriate evidence from their lives, from their reading, from what they've learned in school. And so I chose the article, Is Google Making Us Stupid?, from the Atlantic Monthly, because one, that's a challenging um, publication, and so it's got the rigor, but also because I really wanted to pick something that would be relatable for them. These students did grow up with the internet, and the author did not. And so I wanted to incur remind them and encourage them to share their voices because those voices are an important part of this conversation in our culture. So my first question is just for you to list, so I'm going to give you a minute to do it, everything you love about Google. And really think about how it, things you love about it in your personal life, in your school life, everything you love about Google. Okay, put your pens down. And I just am going to ask you guys to shout some of them out because we want to kind of get a sense of the room and how people, you know, what, what people, what's going on for people, what they think. I'm going to ask you to shout it out loudly, but I'm also going to ask you to respect other people's voices and, and wait for other people to share as well. So let's hear it. What are some of the things you love about Google? The different title pages for like holidays. I use, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you like that. The different title pages. I, I use it to settle <laughs> arguments with my friends and family. Say more about that. Oh <laughs> uh, well, like when, when I like me and my brother or my mom don't agree on something, and like oh I'm right, I Google it, <laughs> and I'm either right or I'm wrong. Okay. Other people. Usually right. Usually right. Always being able to get info. Like you, there's no excuse to not know something anymore. Good. Good for comparison shopping. Comparison shopping. Yeah, like, <laughs> like you type in what you want, and it brings up that item on any website, and then you can do price low to high, or like quality high to low. Yeah. Good. It actually is useful. What else? Like you can get a bunch of different perspectives if you're trying to like research. Okay. What else? It keeps getting more efficient. It keeps getting more efficient. Is you guys? No. Yeah. Oh, this are looking okay. good, right? Okay. You're looking good. This is how I'm grouping you today. So you have to get up out of your chairs with your article and go sit with the people who you are next to on screen. Why are they on the screen? I can bring some here. We're staying here. I guess. Oh, pay attention. So the, the title is, is Google making us stupid because you want your title to be provocative because you want people to read, right? Yes. But that's not really what the article is about. He doesn't even mention Google till four pages in. So the first thing I want you to do with your groups, and I'm going to give you one minute to do this, is I want you to come up with some synonyms for Google that you could put in there instead that would still reflect what he's talking about. And they can be one word things or they can be phrases, two or three words max, okay? So instead of is Google making us stupid, is blank making us stupid. And you can come up with in your groups and file those. Go. Surfing the web. Yeah, I points about like deep reading and like how we're not actually like more scared. Like it's internet reading. Is Google making us stupid? Now nobody wants to be called stupid. Even my five-year-old knows that's one of the worst words out there, right? Stupid. Okay. So we're gonna try to rephrase everything after Google now. Is Google what? And you can change the word. It doesn't have to be maybe. Is Google altering? Is Google affecting? Is Google something? Okay. So you're gonna try to do five uh, second half of the question changes. One minute, go. I think it's making us spoil. Yes. I actually know. 
Okay, so now in your groups you have to identify a one, a two, and a three, and then on your sheet write down what you are. So just number off one, two, three. On your sheet, identify who you are. What do you mean? Just number, you count yourself off. One, two, three. One. And write down what you are. So you remember. Okay, I'm going to hear from each group. And I'm going to hear from my number two. So if you're number two, you have to give me one of your words, okay? So over here, this group. Um, is Google making us lazy? No, 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 just the word. Is, oh, is the word, sorry. For internet. Google, sorry. What? Internet. Is the internet making us stupid? My number two. Uh, technology. Is technology making us stupid? Efficiency. Efficiency making us stupid. Is easy access to whatever? Say that again, easy access. Easy access to whatever. To information. information. Information, okay. And then my number two over here. Help or algorithmic thinking. I don't know if I can spell that. You can't. <laughs> Did I do it wrong? No, it's good. Okay. All right, and then back around this way, my number one. Is Google not making us stupid? Is Google what? Uh, lessening our attention spans. Is Google lessening our attention spans? My number one over here. Is it making us more machine than human? Is it making us more machine than human? Yeah. Over here. Um, is Google thinking for us? Is Google thinking for us? Over here. Um, is Google making us lazy? So at the end of the essay, Nicholas Carr says, perhaps those who dismiss critics of the internet as Luddites or nostalgists will be proved correct. So in the first box, and some of you may know even more from your AP European history class, and you don't have to write what I have, you can write it your way. But um, the historical de definition and the context for that word is in the 19th century, um, English textile artisans who, pro who uh, protested against the newly developed labor-saving machinery because it was costing them their jobs. And so the stocking frames, this, um, the power looms that were introduced during the Industrial Revolution threatened to replace these artists with less skilled low-wage workers because anyone can operate a machine. So I'm going to give you a minute to get that down. You don't need to copy it down. You need to put it in your own words. That's what the historical definition is. What I want you to do, and you can do this together, is I want you to talk about, so if that's what it was in the 19th century, what, when it's being used today, does it likely mean? Contemporary definition. So you guys can talk about that, figure that out. What is the contemporary definition? That the engagement activities worked well because they were often, I had them do some work individually, and then I moved to having them do it in small groups, and then we talked more as a large class. So they were hearing different voices, and they were hearing different perspectives. But the research shows that it helps you remember words when you have pictures or symbols or something um, that's not written language that will help you remember it. So you can either do this individually or you can kind of give each other ideas of what to draw. But just for a minute, draw something, whether it's a symbol or a picture, of what you would think of when you think of a Luddite. Okay, and the last thing we're going to do is going to be an individual. So what I'd like you to do is to try, is to write a sentence where the sentence is interesting, clever, creative, maybe funny, write an interesting sentence in which you use the word Luddite. Okay, so here's what we're going to do now. You've shared your sentences, right? Yes? Okay, so the group is going to put the person with the best sentence on blast, okay? So you're picking the person with your best sentence, and that person's standing up. Blast usually is a bad thing, but this is a good blast. Come on, yes, stand up. Stand up. Okay, we're going to quickly hear the sentences. Let's go. Okay, the Luddite attacked the new machinery, though it was made for good purpose. Okay. 
The Luddite was annoyed by her daughter's obsession with texting. Yo, Luddy, you passed the typewriter. My laptop just died. <laughs> uh, Grandma Kate used to be a Luddite until she found Facebook. Um, get off the computer and go outside, Mom said. Luddite, I retorted. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. And we're going to really try to figure out where you would put Nicholas Carr from a complete net hater wants to somehow get rid of it and go back to somebody who loves it so much that it's their whole life, okay? You're trying to place him in the spectrum. And after you, or as you're figuring out where you're gonna place him, you, are, you need to find at least four quotes from the text and write those quotes down with the page numbers that support your position. Okay, so you need to come up with a position of where you put him, and you need at least four pieces of evidence to back it up. And the text has to be from throughout the essay. It can't just be from the first two pages. I got one. A few Google searches. So I feel as if I got the factor picky quote. It was after research. So it's required days in the stacks of periodicals and libraries. Can now be done in a minute. For me, um, I teach different levels. I teach intermediate, and then right now this class was an AP class, and it's been that quest It's been most interesting in my AP class because a lot of people would say it's not needed there. That CLR is not needed there. The students are compliant. They know how to be successful in the system. They will sit and listen and take notes, and they will learn traditionally, and they will seem to like it. Um, but for me, CLR has made me rethink the difference between being a compliant student and an engaged student. And for me, all kids need to be engaged and to be making meaning. And that's why I think CLR benefits all students.